Hello. It's Friday, uh, September the 5th. Um, it's hard to believe we're already at the end of the second week of the course, or the, of the course and of the semester. Uh, things have been moving, moving very quickly, even like accelerating, so I'm sure it's been a uh, crazy two weeks for you, uh, doing classes and whatever all else that you do. Uh, so anyway, what I'd like to do, I'm maybe in a way kind of a week behind where I wanted to be with the videos. I've got some uh, profs notes posted. I did a little while ago. And uh, they're on chapter two. And then I've got some drafts for chapter three, four, and five, which I'll do later, probably next week or so, so we can get those readings, uh, the first several chapters of uh, Mustakas behind us. I let go of chapter one. It's um, sort of a comparison of the phenomenological method with um, other theoretical ways of looking at the world, hermeneutics and all. Uh, looks at the similarities and the differences, but it's not really anything germane to our course, I think, that chapter one. It's good to, if you have a chance, take a look at it and kind of see where phenomenology is in relation to other ways of thinking about things um, that we're doing. Um, one of the things that uh, is important for us to keep in mind, this is a transcendental phenomenological method. It's a mouthful, it doesn't come trippingly off the tongue, um, but it is a way for us to disentangle um, ourselves from um, our relationship with the world, to be able to step back and, um, as someone says in one of Merleau-Ponty's book, um, see the wonder of it, the wonder of the world in front of us that we don't always see because we're like embedded in the everydayness of it. And that works well for us because we don't have to stop and think every moment what we got to do next. Things become kind of routine. Uh, we socially navigate it based on principles and rules and things our mamas told us and all of that. Uh, and that's how we navigate. Uh, assumptions that we make. Um, and that's okay. And oftentimes uh, what, what happens when we become aware of the everydayness of life is when something unusual happens. We're walking down the hallway, a really close friend's coming out of the way, walks right past us and disses us. And we think, wow, that's a breach. That's the unexpected. What is there about our relationship that would at that moment have him do that? Um, so that's like a, a breach, uh, an inadvertent one at that case. It's not one that we did intentionally, but it happened nonetheless. There are intentional breaches. We'll talk more about those in a couple of weeks. But one of the things that we do in the transcendental phenomenology is bracket phenomenon of interest to us, step back and look at them because we're so entangled. Uh, Merleau-Ponty in one of his books says, um, and I put it in the notes I posted today, where we are too tightly held in the world to be able to know itself, our existence, at the moment of its involvement. That's everydayness, a way uh, that he would say everydayness. Um, so what's important for us as qualitative methodologists is to be able to step back as a practice. Um, as we approach whatever it is we're approaching in the way of social phenomena, maybe it's the a neighborhood to talk about, talk about community health, maybe it's uh, uh, first responders, uh, the phenomenon that they go through, all of these sort of things, to be able to step back, bracket those, and look at them. Uh, in order to, and in a way that what that's about is when we see them like that, be able to visualize, get these phenomena. Remember, we're not physical scientists where we have a frog in front of us that we can taste and, and smell and touch and hear and all that sort of thing. Social phenomena for us often are invisible. We have to do things to create their presence. Look at the indicators of their presence. That noema of friendship we want to look at it noetically and look at the structures that friendship is for us. Those structures are the indicators of its presence that we don't ordinarily think about. Maybe one piece of the structure is um, the expectation when you run into a friend that's a good friend and they say hello to you, but if they dish you, that the whole thing doesn't burst apart, but it becomes present uh, for us to examine it. We prefer to examine things intentionally than by uh, things that are not so intentional. It may seem uh, unexpected and harmful, like being dissed by a friend. But the point of it is that as qualitative researchers, we, m we must be practiced at putting the creating the phenomenon in front of us. And if it is something like if you want to talk about mental health in a neighborhood, let's say, as a phenomenon, being able to put it in front of us, bracket it, set it out, not look at it from our perspective, but get it out there objectively, where 
intermingle subjectivity and objectivity. Separate that out so our subjectivity can look at that objectivity and not examine it so much as expose it. And then for those people that are in it, like the neighborhood, they become at that point, as Mustaka says, our co-researchers. Listen to them. The moment we have that noema, that phenomenon in front of us, then we can listen to our co-researchers, those that are embedded in it, and those on the outside who want to understand it. So qualitative methods is very important. Transcendental uh, methodology is very important to qualitative methods because it is a method for revealing the noema, the social phenomenon, and being able to examine it uh, either by ourselves, ourselves, or with our co-researchers. So that's really what we're after. And um, as a uh, something that we do as practice, it's a little bit unusual, but it's not something that is that unusual for us. If you're sitting at a mall and say you're waiting for your significant other who's in a shop, and you're sitting in a, you know, you're sitting out there in a. Uh, a bench in the mall and you're just watching people, social scientists, you know, like to watch people. Um, and you watch a group of people go by and you wonder, well, I wonder if they're a family or are they friends? Or they just happen to be an aggregate that are in the crush of events thrust together, you know. That very thing that you're doing right there is an expo, uh, is an epoche. You're blocking things out, you're looking at that cluster, you're doing a transcendental reduction and focus on that, looking at the texture of it and then what you're doing is the imaginative variation you're trying to then run all of the things in your mind and heart and soul that are familiar to you for describing what you're looking at and wondering which of those variation th items that are varying in your mind as possibilities is the one that represents that cluster you see in front of you we do this a lot uh, i think you probably will admit you do this a lot you do it at the house you do it a lot of times just do it people do it now, there are a lot of things that we do, probably 90 percent we go through, and we don't do those kinds of things. But there are times in our lives every day when we're just sort of in a relaxed mode, shall we say, and somewhat disengaged, and we see uh, the world. I mean, see it as in italics. And this course is about seeing it uh, in italics. Seeing it in italics. So uh, uh, I have posted the first... Um, assignment, uh, where is it? Here it is. It is the method of transcendental phenomenology. <coughs> it was posted on the 30th. It's due on Friday the 12th, about a week out. And uh, it is about going through the process of the epoche, the reduction, and the imaginary variation. Uh, it, the sort of preliminary description is in chapter 2, and I talk about it in these notes for chapter 2 of Moustakas. Um, if you want to look at the detail of it, you can reach out into chapter 5, which we'll talk about in some detail next week and the week after. Um, but you can reach out chapter 5 if you like. But all what you need to do to do this transcendental phenomenology is uh, what's in chapter 2. And as you do it, you'll see that it's something you do. You do epoche. You do the reductions. You do the imaginative variation. Just in the illustration I gave a moment ago, when you are uh, in a mall, or you're standing in line behind uh, a group of people or a, a line of people in, uh, at a grocery store, you know, and you just kind of, you know, you don't want to look at those crazy magazines there that tell you the same thing about everybody and, you know, uh, you get tired of those after a while, so you just start looking around, the people around you, and then you begin wondering, well, who is that person? What do they do? I wonder what they do in their life, you know? Well, what's a couple there? I wonder if they're boyfriend, girlfriend, I wonder if they're married or... You know, you just, all these things, I don't think it's just me. I think we all do that sort of thing. That is an epoche. That is a reduction. And that is imagining variation. As researchers, practitioners, as sociologists, we're one step removed from that everyday kind of looking at things and exploring and imagining to being more scientific and more intentionally putting it out in front of us to examine it. So uh, do the epoche. You know, and the, uh, find some thing out there. At, you know, you're sitting at a taco house or you're at the mall or you're sitting on a, a city bus or around the dinner table at home or wherever you want to be. Uh, take a moment intentionally and uh, do an epoche, a reduction, and imagining variation. It would be best if you did it in a phenomenon like not do it at home because you probably have an idea about what all those dynamics are for the most part. But more as though you were a, um, uh, a non-participant observer, 
if you're doing it with family, you're like a participant observer, right? So a non-participant observer in the sense that maybe you don't know the people uh, that are clustering or whatever the thing that you're doing. So that it becomes more problematic for you to come to understanding in your variation. What exactly is that? Uh, so look for something like that and do your your epoche. Uh, there's some description of it here. There's some description up online where I posted it. And there's uh, some considerable description in the notes, props notes that I uh, posted this um, earlier this afternoon, or maybe it was this morning. Um, so I think you'll, you'll find uh, the notes um, interesting. I do, uh, I do some, uh, I like uh, Piet Mondrian. I'm not sure that I say it in the proper way in French, but I think there are aspects of what he does that uh, are, are fascinating. Where we go from a tree to something like a tree to something even maybe less like a tree, as we look at a tree and begin to do the reduction and look at that, the variation, the relationships within that tree that are the structure, shall we say, of that noematic tree. Uh, I think Mondrian is just a wonderment at uh, that kind of imagery. Of course, it gets real abstract. The next one of these would, of course, be a series of just rectangles and blocks and squares and different colors as he takes it even more down, reduces it down even more. But when you look at, re uh, when you look at it, Mondrian, I mean, it is all about relationships. And that's really what this thing is about in Transcendental uh, Phenomenological Method. It's about looking at the relationships, the structure of the noematic phenomenon in front of us, the social phenomenon, friendship, whatever it might be. Uh, so, uh, and remember, what's, what is important about this is, um, while it's fun to do, I suppose you'd say, because we do it all the time, and it's even fun to do it as a sociologist, kind of as a scientific way, um, it's essential that we get a good grasp of this because as qualitative practitioners and researchers, the last thing we want to do is to go into somebody's life with a presupposition that we know what's going on and predefine it. Uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to listen. In order to do that, we've got to do the reduction and let that imaginative variation go. In this case, the, the imaginative variation may be not so much what we hear in our ears, between our ears, but opening our ears to the imaginative variation of what we hear around us and our co-researchers inside that noema. All right, so it's Friday afternoon, and we got a weekend coming up. So I uh, hope everyone's well, and uh, we will be in touch next week. Y'all take care, you hear?